This is the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather and Connie Chung. Good evening. President Clinton's deal providing Mexico with billions of dollars in emergency economic help was signed, sealed, and delivered today. The deal is widely expected to send interest rates soaring in Mexico, even trigger a recession there. It could also result in job losses here. More about the U.S.-Mexico deal from White House correspondent Rita Braver. With many Americans at best ambivalent about his ordering of a $20 billion U.S. bailout for Mexico, the president himself steered clear of the formal signing of the most ambitious international economic rescue mission of his presidency. Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin was point man to explain administration fears that collapse of Mexico's economy could imperil the U.S. by spreading through Latin America. That could reduce or even reverse progress in countries that have the potential and in our judgment are very likely to become the greatest export opportunities for this country in the decades ahead. Opportunities that create American jobs and support American standards of living. But Congress is jittery over Mexico's commitment to repaying U.S.-backed loans. So as collateral, payments from foreign customers buying Mexican oil will be funneled to a special account at the Federal Reserve Board Bank of New York. As long as Mexico pays its debts, it gets the money. If not, the U.S. Treasury can seize the account. Late today, the president said U.S. taxpayers are protected. Then we have very good collateral on this deal. So we have done the right thing by the American taxpayers and the American people. But one House Democrat says this country is unlikely to ever seize Mexican oil revenues. I don't believe it would be viable for the United States of America to take food which is oil out of little Mexicans uh, stomachs and put it into our federal treasury. It simply wouldn't happen. You would have a revolution in Mexico. In fact, the stringent terms of the deal sent the Mexican stock exchange plunging and some analysts fear a recession there. Administration officials say it's just a short-term problem, but if they're wrong, that could have a profound effect on American jobs, undercutting a major reason for the bailout. Rita Braver, CBS News at the White House. For all the talk in Washington today about U.S. ties to Mexico, there's another big push on right now to make all that talk English only. It's a proposed cutoff of federal funds for bilingual education. The larger issue when it comes to basic language, should America be individual slices of heritage or one whole American pie? Scott Pelley reports from one testing ground in Texas. At the very moment Mrs. Hernandez's third grade students were studying America, funding for their bilingual class in Texas was under attack in a place called Washington, D.C. That is why today, Madam Speaker, I am introducing the National Language Act, which will declare English to be the official language of this country. Under the act, foreign languages no longer would appear on federal documents, on ballots, or in citizenship ceremonies. But the effect would be greatest in schools. One knows. In America's classrooms today, two and a half million students do not speak English well. If the act becomes law, funding for bilingual education will drop to zero by the beginning of school next fall. That's a cut of nearly $250 million a year. What would be at stake for those kids? Well, reality, uh, probably the rest of their education. You're not really equipped to think in that language or to read with any kind of comprehension in that language. So it's very difficult to really do well in school. Bilingual education shields people from reality. It keeps them living in their own uh, native culture, speaking their own native language, and prevents them from breaking into the American mainstream. English only is sweeping the nation. 19 states have adopted it. At least 13 others are considering it. But none ban bilingual education. This type of uh, an effort would add to the divisions uh, in America, and it seems like a contract on the immigrants as opposed to uh, trying to bring us all together into common ground. Congress has failed to pass English-only bills eight times before. The chances may be much better now with the new Congress. If the bill succeeds, Mrs. Hernandez's class and many others will have to catch up fast to the new lesson in civics. Scott Pelley, CBS News, Irving, Texas. Another ingredient in the multicultural melting pot is on the front burner at the U.S. Supreme Court. It's a case that could have a national impact on gay rights. 
The high court today agreed to decide whether Colorado and other states may ban laws protecting homosexuals from discrimination. Another attempt to get cigarette makers to cough up the cost of smoking-related diseases. That story is next. Also tonight, a custody battle over twins and a Solomon-like decision. But how wise is it? And Eye on America. They're in the Army now. Women getting down to basics. Kellogg's All Brand. High in fiber, low in fat, and a good source of calcium. Because you want to do it all. Kellogg's All Brand. Do it all. Try the good fiber and great taste of All Brand muffins. Check the recipe on the box. Finally, I was soloist instead of my sister Patty. What a time for a cough. <coughs> Patty gave me Robitussin cough drops. They worked fast in those vapors. Thanks to Robitussin, I made my sister warm. proud. Robitussin, cough drops from the cough experts. So people with severe dry skin really suffer. That's why Vaseline developed Dermasil, which adds lipids. You see, lipids help dry skin heal itself. Dermasil from Vaseline Pharmaceutical Research. Dermasil lotion sounds like medicine. It is medicine. At the O.J. Simpson double murder trial today, Detective Tom Lang testified that Nicole Brown Simpson probably was killed first. Lang said there was no blood on her feet, meaning to him that she went down before a bloody fight between Ron Goldman and his killer. Meanwhile, Judge Ito has summoned key defense witness Rosa Lopez to a Friday hearing to determine whether she might flee before she's called to testify. The tobacco industry has never had to pay a penny in damages for diseases allegedly caused by smoking. Well, Florida is now out to change that. The state filed a civil suit today to try to force cigarette makers to pay more than a billion dollars in Medicaid costs. Diana Gonzalez has the story. Ira Stark is the kind of patient the state of Florida and tobacco companies are fighting over. The machine makes me breathe. A three-pack-a-day smoker, Stark was diagnosed with emphysema just a few months ago. Already, his medical bills exceed $30,000. Because he is disabled, someone else has to pick up the tab. And who do you think that should be, the state or the tobacco company? Absolutely the tobacco company. Why? Because they're the people making the profits from selling these things. The state couldn't agree more. That's why today it filed suit against two big tobacco companies, R.J. Reynolds and Philip Morris. Florida is seeking $1.4 billion, its estimated cost of treating welfare patients for smoking-related illnesses since 1990. It's our chance to free Florida's taxpayers from this burden and make the tobacco industry pay for the death and sickness it sponsors. The tobacco companies are firing back. Whether you like smoking or not, nobody puts a gun to your head and makes you smoke. It's a choice, and people are aware of the risks associated with smoking. That smokers are aware of the risks is the traditional and successful defense cigarette manufacturers use in court. But Florida now has a tobacco liability law that says tobacco companies can't use that defense. The companies argue that's unconstitutional. It's not right to have the legislature aim a law specifically at one party or one group and try to punish just that group. But Ira Stark argues the tobacco companies have made plenty of money off loyal customers like himself. So loyal, he still smokes when he's not hooked up to his oxygen machine, paid for now by Florida taxpayers. Diana Gonzalez, CBS News, Miami. A judge in Massachusetts has come up with a split decision in a bitter child custody case. The parents are divorced. The children are twins. And as correspondent Jacqueline Adams reports, the case is not closed. For 10 years, identical twins Sheena and Tara Raymond have lived together, played together, grown up together. Now, however, a judge has decided to split them up, and the girls are devastated. I tell you what, it really stinks. Each of their divorced parents wanted custody of the twins, so the judge asked the girls what they wanted. Sheena said she'd be willing to live with her mother. Tara said she wanted to stay with her father. The girls never expected that Judge James Lawton would act on what they told him and separate them, except for school and weekends. You can't stand it. I can't stand being away from Sheena. 
and the judge shouldn't have done that. In many ways, the parents' reaction to the ruling mirrored their bitter custody battle. The mother downplayed any damage to the children and, in a written statement, objected to the publicity. The father, however, was so outraged, he called in the media to try to get the decision reversed. The twins have a special bond. It's a bond that you and I will never understand because we don't have it. Um, they feel each other's pain. Indeed, experts say losing a twin can be devastating emotionally. I think it will have a profound negative effect on, on these children unless this judge's ruling is reversed, then I hope to God it is. If judges make mistakes, child psychologist Francis Stott said, it's because they have no clear rules to follow. The judge is treating these two 10-year-old girls as if they're property and as if they don't have best interest, interests apart from their parents. Children often become the pawns in bitter, messy divorces, and too frequently common sense flies out the window. The judge will have a chance to change his decision at a hearing in June. Jacqueline Adams, CBS News, New York. Alex Kelly had it all, a good-looking high school star raised in a posh suburb till he was accused of two brutal rapes. He was backed up against the wall. There was no place for him to run. But run he did, eight years living the good life in Europe. Now the game is up. But how much did his parents know? What would you have done? Eye on America tomorrow on the CBS Evening News. Thousands of U.S. troops are off the east coast of Africa tonight. They're practicing for a last landing in Somalia. Within days, they will go ashore to help evacuate U.N. peacekeepers and withdraw U.S. military equipment. Somali warlords who wrecked the peacekeeping efforts say they will not interfere with the pullout. Another truce has collapsed in Chechnya, and Russian forces are back on the offensive against Muslim rebels. The Chechens are still holding out in parts of the capital, and they're vowing to fight for 100 years. Correspondent Tom Fenton reports. After a short break, the war in Chechnya is up and running again at full speed. Once again, Russian soldiers are striking targets large and small, leaving little room for Chechen maneuver. All roads leading to the Chechen capital, Grozny, have now been cut and hopes for a negotiated settlement have all but disappeared. Recent talks broke down when the fighting heated up. The Russians now demand unconditional surrender. The Chechens insist on Russian withdrawal. It's not the stuff compromises are made of. Grozny itself has become a barely living testament to the awesome and indiscriminate power of the Russian army. Russia's own human rights agency is now saying as many as 25,000 civilians may have died in the onslaught. And that doesn't count the living dead, the desperate men and women who wander amidst the rubble, the filthy children for whom death has become a game. But this game has no winners. As the Chechens continue to battle, the Russian body count continues to climb. The men in Moscow will say they've lost a thousand men. Not likely. That's how many bodies have passed through this one makeshift morgue alone. If the front is dangerous, there's also trouble to the rear. The mothers of Russian soldiers are on the march, trying to impose a ceasefire on their sons, hoping only to bring them back alive. And now a new ingredient is being stirred into the Chechen mess. President Clinton, once a supporter of Yeltsin's intervention in Chechnya, is backing off earlier plans for a May summit in Moscow. Clinton must now choose between battering Russian pride or taking a beating at home for appearing to endorse the slaughter. Tom Fenton, CBS News, Moscow. Russia was declared the winner today of the Cold War. The Canadian government says that with the breakup of the Soviet Union, Russia is now the coldest country on Earth with an average yearly national temperature of about 22 degrees. Canada drops to second at 24 degrees. The American balloonist who took off from South Korea Saturday crossed into Canada today. That made 50-year-old Steve Fawcett the first person to fly a balloon solo across the vast Pacific. 